Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new lecture of our course on heterogeneous systems. Today, we are going to talk about convolution, an important parallel pattern that is widely used in image processing and machine learning. Before we talk about convolution, let me quickly recap on what have been the parallel patterns that we have covered so far. We started with a reduction, an operation that reduces a set of values to a single value. It requires to have certain properties like associativity, commutativity, and an identity value. Reduction is a key primitive for parallel computing, as you already know. Um, in order to implement efficiently a, a reduction into uh, on a GPU or other parallel processors, we have to make use or we have to make sure that the mapping is divergence free. We explain that and we explain how to um, make sure that the warps that are active are fully utilized in order to maximize the utilization and uh, that way maximize the performance of the reduction operation. The second parallel pattern that we covered was uh, histogram computation. Histogram is a frequently used computation for reducing the dimensionality and extracting notable features. Remember that in histogram, what we do for every input element is to identify the being of the histogram that this element belongs to and update or increment the corresponding counter, the counter that is associated to each being. Um, in, a, in, in a parallel implementation of histogram computation, we have to take care about the fact that we have multiple threads running in parallel and these threads might want to update the same locations of the histogram or the same beams of the histogram at the same time. In order to avoid data races, we have to use atomic operations. But atomic operations essentially entail an important or might entail an important overhead. Whenever we have, have an atomic conflict, there will be serialization and this serialization affects the performance. So we were discussing a few optimi important optimizations in order to um, improve the performance of histogram computation. And the most important one was privatization that essentially consists of um, creating some subhistograms in the case of the GPUs, we create per, per block subhistograms in shared memory. And at the end of the execution, when these subhistograms are complete, we perform a parallel reduction in order to obtain the final histogram in global memory. Okay, let's talk about uh, convolution. And let's start defining what is uh, convolution and what are its applications. Convolution is a widely used operation in signal processing, image processing, video, video processing, and computer vision. Convolution essentially applies a filter or a mask or a kernel on each element of the input in order to obtain a new value, the corresponding element of the output, which is a weighted sum of the uh, set of neighboring input elements. Observe that um, the uh, what we apply on each input element, a filter mask or kernel. Uh, over the course of this lecture, we are going to avoid the term kernel uh, just uh, because we don't want to create any confusion uh, due to the fact that the functions that are executed on the GPU, as you as you already know, are called kernels as well. So we will stick to either filter or mask over the course of this uh, presentation. Convolution is uh, widely used in image processing, can be used for smoothing, sharpening, or blurring an image, also for finding edges or for removing noise. We are going to see a few examples of this later in this lecture. But um, more importantly, these days are the applications that convolution has in machine learning and artificial intelligence, because they are key for convolutional neural networks, for CNNs or ComNets, where the convolutional layers are uh, probably uh, the most important ones. We are going to start simple. We are going to start talking about a 1D convolution example. This is uh, the type of convolution that would be used, for example, in audio processing, because audio is uh, one dimensional. Let's assume that we have an uh, input array, in this case is uh, input N, it might be an audio signal, and we have our mask uh, M. In this, in this case, the mask is of size five. Usually the mask size is going to be um, an odd number of elements for symmetry, as you'll see. And we have to calculate the elements of the output. In this case, the output is the array P. So let's first see how to calculate the element P2. To calculate the element P2, what we have to do is placing the mask on top of element P2, center on, on the element N2, and, um, and we perform some 
first of all, partial products. Observe that here, what we are doing is multiplying each element of the uh, input, uh, input um, um, array. And this N0 is multiplied by M0 and the result is three. This N1 is multiplied by M1 and the result is, a, a, is eight and so on and so forth. So after that, what we do is reducing these partial products or summing them all. And the result is the value P2. Now we can go to the next element, in this case, P3, the next element of the output. So we would do exactly the same. We place the mask on top of element N3, and then we perform the multiplications of each element of, uh, of uh, N uh, multiplied by each element of the mask M. And these are the partial products, and then we reduce them and obtain the value P3. But now what happens when we are we have to compute for an element that is near the boundary of the uh, input array? In this case, for example, M1. Here we have to take care about boundary conditions. The calculation of all output elements near the boundaries, either at the beginning or at the end of the input array, need to deal with ghost elements. What are the ghost elements? Are elements that really doesn't exist because they don't belong to the input image, but we or to the input uh, array in this case, but we have to give them some values and there are different policies for that. We can, for example, uh, consider that all ghost elements are zero or we can uh, replicate the boundary value. So in this uh, particular example, um, we are um, uh, using zero as a cost element, as you see here. And we have to use this cost element in this uh, specific example when we want to calculate P1. So when we place the mask centered on top of M1. So here we perform the multiplications, as you see, because this element, um, the cost element is zero, the corresponding partial product is zero. And after that, we uh, perform the reduction and obtain the value P1 in this case. And here you can see some code for the 1D uh, convolution kernel with boundary condition handling. Um, observe that here we have the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the input arguments of this um, uh, kernel, we have the uh, input N, the input array N, we have the mask M, and we have the output P. We also have here the width, that is the total size of the input N, and also we have the mask width. So very first thing to do is to define what's the index of the output element and this index of the output element comes from the block index, block dimensions and uh, thread index as usual. We also declare this uh, p-value that is going to be a, a variable that we use as accumulator and then um, we have to uh, obtain what's the index of the first neighbor that we have to uh, use with that, that we have to, uh, to use for the calculation corresponding to the output element that is assigned to each individual thread. And observe that this n start point is obtained from the from i, that is the index of the output element assigned to the, this particular thread minus mask width uh, divided by two or mask width over two. Why is that? Because the mask is centered on the element i and um, and we have to start uh, computing. We have to start using the uh, elements of the input that are at a distance uh, half of the mask size. And here we have the for loop, as many iterations as the size of the mask. Uh, we have to check the boundaries to make sure that uh, we don't go out of bounds. We don't compute whatever is not going to be useful. So that's why we make sure that the um, a starting point uh, plus the value of the mask that we are using at this point uh, is uh, greater than zero and or greater or equal than zero and is um, smaller than the width in order to make sure that we are um, within boundaries. And here we perform a multiply and accumulate operation, as you see, by reading one element of the um, input array N, the corresponding element of the mask M, performing the multiplication and accumulating in this uh, p-value. At the very end of the um, execution of this for loop, we store the p-value uh, in the corresponding location in, in this uh, p-array that is the output and resides in global memory. 
But now uh, notice that in the previous example, we have used uh, M and N and P, uh, the three of them residing in global memory. Uh, but in the end, there is um, uh, some data reuse here because um, the threads that are involved in this calculation, in this computation, they are using, uh, uh, let's say, common common input value, some of them coming from the input array and others coming from the mask. So we can make sure we can make use of the uh, different memory spaces that are provided by uh, CUDA and the uh, GPU. And they remember that this is the memory hierarchy of the GPU, uh, threads belonging to the same block can share data through the shared memory, but they can also access data from global memory or from constant memory. And one interesting thing of this constant memory is that it is cache. So what means is that there is some space, it's a small cache in each of the GPU cores that can be used to store, to keep values that are constant and frequently accessed by uh, the threads running on the corresponding GPU core or uh, SM. So let's uh, see how we are going to use this constant memory. We are going to use this constant memory to store the mask. Uh, we can do that because usually the mask is small. The mask is constant and it's accessed by all threads running uh, on the GPU core in this um, specific example of the uh, convolution. Um, the constant memory, as I mentioned before, is cached inside each GPU core, and, um, and, 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 these, and it has a one characteristic that the constant memory is particularly fast when all threads of the warp access the same value. So in that case, we can have very fast accesses to the constant memory and our code can become uh, pretty um, uh, high performance. So first of all, we are going to declare the mask as a global variable. This is the way to do this. Uh, we, in this case, define the uh, mask width equal to five. And here we declare the uh, mask M by using this constant qualifier. Then we have to initialize the mask from the host. And to do so, we are going to use this uh, CUDA main copy to symbol function where we can identify the destination M, that is the mask in constant memory, the source, this M underscore age that resides in the main memory of the host processor and the size of the mask, mask width times uh, size of load. So this is the same code that we uh, have seen before the 1D convolution kernel with boundary conditions, but now observe that we don't have any more M here uh, among the input parameters of this kernel. However, we declare outside of the kernel as a constant, and now uh, we directly use the, the mask. In, in this case, we directly use this mask um, in inside our code, uh, but this mask now resides in constant memory, as uh, we have said. The only thing to take into account is that we have to use it with caution because the constant cache is small. It's around uh, 60, 64 kilobytes. So we cannot expect that we can uh, uh, store there like very large our input arrays, even if they are, uh, are going to be constant. There are uh, other uh, ways of uh, dealing with such large arrays that uh, uh, we can use, for example, using the uh, texture memory if, uh, if we really want to make sure that uh, it's, uh, it's cached in order uh, to uh, take advantage of data reuse in the, from the uh, input array. <clears throat> But now, as I said as well, there are uh, many threads in the convolution. So there are many threads involved in the convolution running on the same GPU core. And these threads share data, right? They reuse the same data when they are applying the mask over the corresponding elements of the input in order to obtain elements of the output. And we know what to do when we have uh, such amount of data reusing or codes, we can use tiling. And this is something that we have already introduced in previous lectures. You might remember uh, this slide where we uh, talk about how to use tiling in a two-dimensional organization by using shared memory. We are going to see something similar today for the uh, convolution. Actually, we are going to start as we uh, have done with the 
1D convolution. So let's take a look at how to, what's the basic idea of the uh, tile 1D uh, convolution. So um, as we normally do, what we are going to do here is dividing the output, in this case, output array P into equally sized blocks, equally sized chunks that are assigned to different thread blocks. From this example, from uh, block zero to block three, we are going to assume as well in this example that each thread block contains or has four threads. And now think about what's the tile that each of the thread blocks need to use to compute the um, output elements, the, the elements of P. So for tile zero or for block zero, that we would use this tile zero for block one, we would use, or we will compute on this tile one from element four to element seven, for block two from element eight to element 11. But now in order to compute the output elements, for example, this uh, element P zero here, we have, or this uh, element um, P three here, we have to use also some um, uh, elements of the input that belong or that in principle have been assigned to other thread blocks, right? And those are what we call the hollow uh, elements. Um, observe as well that among these hollow elements, we also have some ghost elements or ghost cells because they are out of bounds. They are not uh, neither in the input or the output array. So now let's uh, take a look at how we have to load the, the whole tile, including the hollows, into the shared memory that is uh, on chip, that is accessible by all threads uh, running in this thread block. And, um, and this way we can obtain uh, better performance for our 1D convolution. So first of all, let's take a look at how to load the left hollow. Notice that these four elements here of, of the input are those that are, let's say, directly assigned to the uh, corresponding thread block. In this case, we are working on uh, thread block one in this example. And we are going to check also what to do with this um, thread uh, two, with thread index equal to two. But now we have to load this uh, left hollow, these two elements that we find here. And the first thing that we need to obtain is this hollow index left. In this case is equal to two because this hollow index, index left defines where uh, we start loading uh, uh, the hollow from the uh, input array. In the end, what we want to do is loading these two elements into the shared memory, in particular in this n underscore ds uh, array that resides in shared memory. And this is the code that we have to use. First of all, this n is half the size of, I mean, it's actually the the size of the hollow because it's um, an integral division of the max width divided by two. In this case, the max width that we max width that we're considering is five. So um, divided by two is two. That's the size of the hollow that we have to load. And now the hollow index left for each thread in this particular thread block is obtained from the thread index, the block index, and also the uh, sorry the block dimension and also the block index of the previous block. So what that means is that this uh, thread, um, uh, thread with uh, thread index equal two that belongs to block one, in reality, uh, will have to load this element here. How do we know that? Because if this one is block one, this block index minus one is block zero. So um, what we use as the hollow index left is thread ID that is uh, equal to two for um, uh, the, the, the thread number two. So it's uh, element zero, one, and two. So this hollow index left equal two is the hollow index left corresponding to thread index two of this block one. And now uh, we make sure that we only load those values of the, um, uh, you know, the, those values at the left of this uh, chunk of the uh, input array that correspond to the actual hollow. So that's why we only check, we only have working here, those threads that have an index that is uh, greater or equal than the block dimension minus n, that is the size of the hollow. And in that case, what we do is loading the 
uh, corresponding element, this uh, N halo index uh, left, we load it into the corresponding position of the uh, shared memory, as you can see here. So thread two goes to the array and reads this element to here and loads it in this uh, corresponding uh, position in uh, index zero of uh, NDS. Now for the internal elements is uh, as much simpler. So here uh, it's it's just like the, doing the direct assignment. For example, for this uh, thread two is element six that has been assigned. So it just needs to go to the global memory to fetch the corresponding element of array n and load it into the corresponding position of uh, array uh, NDS in shared memory. So we read this element from global memory. We store this element in shared memory. And for the right hollow, we have to do similar calculations to the ones we did for the left hollow. But in this case, we calculate, we need to obtain this hollow index right for each uh, thread ID. The way that we obtain hollow index right is by using the thread ID, the block dimension, and the block index of the next thread block. So if this is block one, so this block uh, ID plus one will be equal to, so for thread, um, with thread index equal to two, we have to load, or not, we don't really load it, but the hollow low index right is uh, this uh, 10. And then uh, inside this uh, if a statement, what we do is making sure that only those threads that are indexed with an um, uh, index uh, lower than the um, uh, hollow size, in this case is two in the example, so only thread zero and one are going to uh, work here, they um, uh, have to go to the uh, corresponding position in the, in the um, array N that is in global memory given by this hollow index, right? They read it from the global memory and then they store it in the corresponding place in uh, shared memory. So for example, for thread zero, hollow index, right, is equal to eight. So thread zero has to go to fetch this element eight from global memory and store it here in uh, shared memory. And this is the complete code where you can identify the different uh, parts that we have uh, discussed in the three previous slides. So here we have the index of the out element that is assigned to each uh, uh, thread running on the GPU. Here we declare the shared memory tile that is the size of the tile taking into account the left and the right hollow. This is the hollow width. So first of all, we load the left hollow as we have described, then we load the internal elements, then we load the right hollow as we have described in the previous slide, then we synchronize. Remember that in each thread block, we have multiple warps running and these warps run, run um, um, are, let's say, um, interleaved in their execution. So we have to make sure that all the warps reach to this point before performing the actual computation that, um, now uses M residing in, uh, M is a mask residing in constant memory, as you already know, and N, the input, the input tile now residing in the shared memory. We perform multipli uh, multiplication and accumulation in this uh, p-value. And finally, after finishing this uh, for loop, we can write the output for the corresponding position of the output array P. So now we are done with the 1D convolution, and we are going to start talking about the 2D convolution, which in reality is uh, very similar, but it has different applications depending on what are the inputs. In particular, we are going to talk for now about uh, image processing and about 2D convolution for images. So for example, a Gaussian filter. In the end, uh, what we are doing here is that using a two-dimensional mask because the input is uh, two-dimensional as well. So let's assume for now that uh, we are using um, a mask of three by three. These might be, for example, a Gaussian mask or a Gaussian filter is one of the um, example uh, convolutions that uh, we are going to talk about uh, in today's lecture. So, but in this um, uh, 2D convolution, the same memory locations are accessed by neighboring threads, as we know. And we have uh, actually seen this uh, example code in a previous lecture. Remember, for every single element of the input image or, or of the output image, we need to access all these elements of the 
input image, but now it turns out that for this element of the output image, we also have to access these six elements of the input image. So there is a possibility of reusing a lot of data here. And in order to take advantage of that, we also use tiling. But the, this tiling in this case is a two-dimensional tiles. And what we do is loading the tiles into the shared memory and then performing the actual computation, applying the um, uh, Gaussian, Gaussian filter in this um, specific example. But now the question is, how do we load these tiles? How do we load the tiles into shared memory? There might be different ways of doing that. Um, one way, it can be probably similar to the one we just seen for um, the um, 1D convolution, where we first load the left hollow, then we load the um, values in the middle, and then we load the right hollow. Another possibility is the one that we are going to explain for these um, two-dimensional tiles. Observe that we have an input, we have the output, and we have, out, uh, we have tiles in the output, but we also have tiles in the input. And now observe as well that the size of these tiles from output and input is different. And why is that? Because we are using a mask. In this case, the mask is five, five by five. In order to calculate um, each element of the output tile, for example, this one, we also have to uh, use some elements that are, some elements from the input that are outside of the dimensions of the uh, output tile. So that's why the input tile dimension is uh, in this example significantly larger than the output tile dimension. And that's uh, only because of the uh, mass and the mass values. So input and output tiles have different dimensions. The input tile dimension is equal to the output tile dimension time uh, plus two times the mass radius. Um, the solution that we propose here is to launch enough threads per block to load the input tile to share memory and then use a subset of them to perform the actual computation. So this is going to be the size of the thread block that we launch to run, to execute on the, um, a GPU core. Observe that the size of the thread block matches the size of the input, the input tile dimension. So uh, what we do is having all threads active such that uh, each thread of the thread block uh, is loading the corresponding element of the input into the uh, shared memory. And then after having completed this loading into shared memory, we synchronize and then we perform the actual computation. But for the actual computation, we only use those threads that are on top of the uh, output tile. So in this uh, example, we are only using four by four uh, threads of the thread block to compute the um, output tile. So some example uh, 2D convolutions that are uh, widely using image processing from an original image. For example, we can apply a blur filter or we can apply a motion blur filter or we can apply a sharpen uh, filter. If you want to uh, find more of these uh, examples, you can go to uh, this website here. And also 2D convolutions are used in the tiny edge detection that is probably the most popular and widely used way of detecting edges or borders uh, in an image. Tiny edge detection um, has uh, four steps. In the first step, we apply the Gaussian filtering in order to smooth the image and remove noise. Um, then we apply another filter, a Sobel fil filter, to find the intensity gradients of the image. And then we uh, have two more uh, stages. The next one is uh, called non-maximum suppression, where we suppress the spurious response to uh, edge detection. And finally, this um, hysteresis uh, thresholding, where we select strong edges and also weak edges that are uh, connected to uh, a strong edge. This is uh, this um, tiny edge detection is a, a very good example of uh, one of the applications of uh, convolution. And convolutions are as well stencils. What is a stencil or what is a stencil computation? Stencils are a class of algorithms where each output element is calculated from a set of neighboring input elements in a structure grid. So essentially the same thing that we have been explaining for uh, the convolution. We have uh, all our output elements and the way that we compute is, uh, is um, we compute every output element is uh, using the 
input elements that are surrounding uh, the position of this output element and performing a, a multiply accumulate by uh, using a, a filter. So essentially a convolution is just a, a special type of uh, stencil computation. Stencils are widely used in high performance computing to solve, uh, for example, partial differential equations. And there are many different types of stencils, for example, uh, 1D, like uh, this 1D Jacobi or 1D seven point, 2D, like the 2D Jacobi or the, the Gaussian filter that um, we have um, discussed before. And there are also like uh, three dimensional convolution. Like for example, you have a quite a complex one here with 33 points or, or with seven points. And of course we can uh, keep increasing the dimensionality of the stencils. Extensive computations update the values in a grid using a fixed um, a pattern of grid points. So that's uh, as a, a structure with grid. And, um, and they are using around 30% of the applications in high performance computing. And here you have um, some examples, for, exa uh, for example, in um, like uh, these uh, uh, fluid dynamic simulation, can edge detection in, in image processing as a, we have seen before, but also uh, widely using climate modeling as well. And actually, about uh, climate modeling or with climate modeling, uh, we uh, work in, in one of our uh, past works where we use an heterogeneous system as well, but not with a GPU, but with an FPGA. Here you have a, a picture of it, of the, uh, the CPU, in this case, uh, an IBM Power9 CPU connected through CAPI2, that is a coherent memory bus through uh, to an um, 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 FPGA, either with uh, HPM memory or with uh, DDR4 memory. We use two different um, FPGAs in this, um, in this um, uh, work. Uh, the CAPI2 is a coherent bus that allows uh, the CPU and the GPU, uh, the CPU and the FPGA uh, to easily uh, exchange uh, data in a coherent manner. We are going to talk about uh, coherent interfaces later in this course as well. And here you can see a gap view of the narrow application framework. Narrow is this um, um, near high bandwidth memory stencil accelerator for weather prediction modeling. Uh, here you can identify in the figure the host processor, the Power9 system, the uh, CAPI interface, and here in the FPA you can uh, see the different processing elements of the near accelerator with the corresponding uh, on-chip memory and the access in this case to um, two stacks of HVM2 memory through the um, HVM memory controller. And here you can uh, find the link to the paper uh, that was presented in FPL uh, 2020. But convolutions are also widely used these days in machine learning, as probably you all know. Uh, convolutions have been traditionally used for feature detection in image processing, but they can also be used as neural network layers. And they actually have uh, certain advantages with respect to fully connected layers that were using uh, multi-layer perceptron uh, neural networks, for example. And the reason is that, uh, and as you can see uh, in the figure, um, a fully connected layer requires in order to compute each element of the in, of the output requires to access all elements of the of the input and apply the corresponding weights of the mask and then uh, perform multiply accumulate operations however in the convolutional layer we are only using local weights we are only using the um, uh, elements of the input that are surrounding uh, the uh, corresponding, um, I mean, the, the, the specific um, element uh, that we are working on. Uh, so we can use local weights. We don't have to compute on the whole input image, for example. We only have to compute on a small window around the element of interest. And the good thing is that uh, because uh, these weights are local, they are not so large. So they can be shared and also they can be placed in on-chip memories that are usually smaller. So we can take advantage of data reuse by doing data sharing um, in the off-chip off -chip mem on on memories, for example, uh, registers or the shared memory uh, in GPUs. 
convolutional neural networks uh, have been proposed many years ago. Uh, Lenet5 is one of the earliest examples from uh, Jiang Lecun, as you can uh, read on the slide, uh, these convolutional neural networks are designed to recognize visual patterns directly from pixels uh, with minimal pre-processing. And here you have another view of this uh, Lenet5 with the different layers that uh, compose it. There is a, so here you can uh, see the convolutional layers, but there are also some subsampling and uh, fully connected layers as well. And this is another example of a, a 2D uh, convolution. <clears throat> here you can see the uh, input feature map is this uh, blue image here. The output feature map is this uh, green one. And then uh, we have a, a kernel that is this um, three by three mask that is going over all the elements of the input <clears throat> in order to perform the weighted multiplication and addition, multiplication and accumulation and obtain the elements of the output feature map. And here you have another nice animation for the um, input uh, feature map. We apply the uh, corresponding uh, filter, in this case, three by three, and obtain the um, elements of the output layer. You can already see uh, as well here in, in, in this example that as, as we apply uh, filters or masks uh, to the input feature maps, also the dimensionality of the um, output or the dimensions of the output feature map get reduced because of the, um, uh, because of the halos. And here you can see another uh, example. In this case, it's like mm, with uh, more clear numbers. So this is or this would be the input feature map. Um, um, and, 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 and here we are in this example applying uh, the CNN filter on, on this uh, element of value five here, perform um, partial uh, multiplications or perform the multiplication of um, each element of the input times the each element of the filter obtain some partial products that we later uh, sum, we later reuse and in order to obtain the value uh, in the output feature map. Observe that the computation in the end is exactly the same as we discussed before for the 1D convolution. The main difference here is that the um, uh, input and output feature maps and the filter or mask are two dimensional. And here you can see some example uh, code for a basic uh, convolutional layer um, in a forward kernel would be used for inference uh, in, the, um, in the neural network. This code is uh, incomplete, but I think that it can give you a clear idea of how to implement this uh, kind of uh, convolutional layer. First of all, as usual, we need to define the uh, indices, in this case, uh, of the output feature map. We also use an accumulator here, and then we have to go over all the channels uh, because usually the, uh, the convolutional neural networks, we have multiple input and multiple uh, output channels. Um, and then uh, for each of the channels, we have to loop over the K by K filter in order to perform these um, partial multiplications of uh, one element of the input feature map X times the uh, filter, the corresponding element of the filter or the mask and accumulate in this accumulator. After we are done uh, with uh, these, uh, all these loops, we accumulate in the uh, corresponding location in the output feature map. And now, very briefly, let me uh, tell you an, an, an anecdote of uh, how everything started. Uh, you, as, as you already know, in this course, we use uh, Professor Wemehu's uh, book, Programming Massively Parallel Processors. And, um, and this book comes from uh, his experience as a, a professor and, and teaching uh, GPU programming since uh, 2000. Uh, seven or 2006, um, and at, at some point in 2010, uh, this course was adopted by uh, Professor Moshevos at the University of Toronto, and some students of Jeffrey Hinton took this course. And these students, after having learned uh, so much about GPU programming, developed the GPU implementation of a convolutional neural network that was trained and uh, with uh, 1.2 million images and won the uh, ImageNet competition. That network is uh, AlecNet, 
and um, it's uh, in some in some way where everything started. It's a deep convolutional neural network that uh, was uh, in this um, ImageNet classification competition like 10% uh, more accurate than the state of the art. Uh, you can see here uh, these um, uh, AlecNet at the and the and the right hand side and compare it to the Lenet that we have also uh, seen before. It has a few. Uh, a few more uh, layers in total it has actually uh, eight uh, layers and, and five convolutional layers as you see one year later google uh, proposed their own network google lenet in this case they increase the number of uh, network layers from eight to uh, 22 and one year later, um, it was uh, Microsoft that uh, proposed this ResNet where they also uh, increased the uh, number of layers. And, um, and as you see, uh, well, uh, from um, 2011 to 2012, we see a lot of improvement due to the first convolutional neural network, uh, AlecNet, as you see, the um, accuracy increased by essentially by almost uh, 10 points. Um, but uh, yeah, even more in 2015, we already had Red ResNet that was even more accurate than uh, humans. And, and as you see as well, how the uh, size of the uh, network has increased from the uh, L, from the uh, eight layers of AlecNet to up to 152 layers in ResNet, and this keeps increasing. The uh, total size of the weights keeps, keeps increasing as well, and they uh, become more and more uh, accurate and reliable. Convolutions are uh, relatively well suited for parallel processors like GPUs, but we can go even one step further by reducing convolution layers to matrix multiplications. Convolution layers are the compute intensive parts of CNNs. That's why they are especially good at uh, running on, on GPUs. And GPUs are uh, very um, efficient implementation, high performance implementations of matrix multiplication. So there are Tiny techniques for matrix multiplications that naturally reuse input features across output feature maps. So converting convolutions in a convolution layer to a matrix multiplication helps to keep the level of parallelism stable across the uh, CNA layers. And here you can see an example of how to do this, how to do this um, reduction of the convolutional layers. Uh, to matrix multiplication. At the top of the figure, you can identify the convolution itself with the uh, input feature maps, convolutional filters, and the output feature maps. So for example, in order to obtain this uh, element here of the output feature map, uh, we have to apply the convolution filters on the uh, three input features um, in the feature maps in this case. So, um, we uh, perform multiplications and additions of uh, this uh, filter over these uh, four elements of the input feature map, same here, same here, and then we obtain this uh, element 12. So the idea behind reducing the convolutional layer into a matrix multiplication is uh, like uh, kind of unrolling the convolution filters and also unrolling the uh, input features. And as you see, uh, you can see here um, these four elements, one, two, one, one, have been enrolled and uh, placed here. These uh, four elements, zero, two, zero, one, have been uh, placed uh, here in this column of this matrix X. And these elements, uh, one, two, zero, one, are now here in this, in the column, in the, in the first column of this matrix X. And we do the same for the convolution filters. Notice that uh, this one, one, two, two is now here, one, one, two, two, one, 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 and so on and so forth. So now if we want to compute, calculate this element here, this value 12, the only thing that we have to do is performing the dot product operation of this row of matrix W times this column of uh, matrix, matrix X. And this way we obtain this uh, element 12. And we know already uh, some ways of op optimizing a matrix multiplication uh, in their execution on GPUs by using uh, tiling. Remember that 
in the very first step, what we are going to do is loading different tiles of matrices A and B into the shared memory and then performing uh, like a multiplication of these uh, tiles or multiplication of these sub matrices and accumulate in the corresponding tile of C. And then uh, we load the next tile and continue uh, performing these uh, multiplication. So uh, something like that can be either uh, extended into a hierarchical decomposition where uh, we first assign tiles of the uh, matrix multiplication, same as we have just seen in the previous slide. We assign these uh, tiles to um, uh, thread blocks. So this would be like the thread block tiles and these thread block tiles reside in shared memory. But then also we have to continue, we can continue the decomposition and then uh, divide the thread block tile into warp tiles that are assigned to warps, and then uh, these warp tiles also assigned to, so divided into smaller tiles that are, that are assigned to uh, individual threads to perform like these um, uh, partial match multiplications. And by doing warp tiles and, use, and doing uh, thread tiles as well, we can also take advantage of tiling into registers. And let me show you like a very, uh, relatively simple example of how to use this joint uh, uh, register and shared memory tiling. In this uh, particular example, we have uh, the two input matrices are M and N, and we are going to use them to compute an output matrix uh, P. So um, we define tiles in both M, N, and, and P, and uh, the dimensions of these tiles are given here, uh, that for example, tile with M equal to four, tile with N equal to two. So here we have, uh, this is, um, uh, this width is four, um, this width is two as, uh, as we uh, are using in this example. So how do we proceed in order to perform a, multiple, a matrix multiplication using register and shared memory tiling? First of all, uh, we are going to store um, uh, elements of the uh, input the matrix M and the output P into registers. We are going to store elements of the matrix N into the shared memory. So these ones here go to registers. Also here, these ones go to registers and these ones go to uh, shared memory. Then observe that we decouple the um, M and N input tile widths. They have, they have different sizes. And uh, but they are uh, these sizes are uh, related to some key quantities. For example, the number of threads. So tile with M is equal to the number of threads that we are using in the thread block, and the output tile size is uh, tile with M times tile with N. So now observe that for uh, each element of N, we reuse each element of N as many times as the size of the M tile. And we reuse each element of M as many tile, as many times as the size of the tile of N. And why is that? Because each thread calculates tile with M elements of P. So for example, think about thread zero. So thread zero is going to compute this element here and this element here. So to do so, thread zero needs to keep this value of M into in registers, in a register, and access these two elements from shared memory. Same thing for thread one, who is going to compute this element here and this element here. So thread one keeps this element into a register and multiplies this element to the two elements that reside in the shared memory. So this is the way, or this is one way of um, using registers and shared memory to do tiling. Uh, these days, GPUs have much more sophisticated computing uh, elements or processing elements for these type of operations, matrix multiplication, convolutions uh, that are uh, essentially um, uh, like, uh, device for deep learning and for matching learning. And these elements, these uh, compute uh, elements, as you know, are the uh, NVIDIA tensor cores. They appeared in the Volta architecture 
Um, here you can see the um, SM or the GPU core of an NVIDIA E100 GPU. And more recently, uh, actually, uh, um, this year has been uh, announced the NVIDIA H100 that already um, improves uh, tensor cores a little bit more. The fourth generation of tensor cores, in this case, they are extended with that support uh, to more uh, floating point, in this case, two different formats of eight bit floating point values. Use. Regarding the architecture, the microarchitecture of the tensor core, we already introduced it in the uh, corresponding uh, lecture about uh, CMD processors and, and GPUs and the architecture of CMD processors and, and GPUs. Remember that um, each warp utilizes two tensor cores. Each tensor core contains two octets, and, um, and there are uh, up to 16 CMD units per tensor core. So there are eight CMD units per octet. A CMD unit probably looks like this. As you can see, there are multipliers here. And then we have some kind of um, other tree in order to perform the uh, reduction. So by, by, by using the, these tensor cores, we can obtain a four by four multi matrix multiply and accumulate each cycle per tensor core. And one of the uh, interesting uh, characteristics of the uh, tensor cores is that uh, unless uh, conventional CMD processors, the register contents are no longer private to each individual thread, but they are shared inside the warp. So let's take um, a quick look at how to use these uh, tensor cores and how to program them. Um, there are ways of loading and storing uh, uh, matrices that reside in global memory or in shared memory into the registers that are going to be used by the tensor cores. The, the, the size of these sub matrices is, um, like, um, is, is, is not arbitrary. There are some uh, sizes uh, that are supported by the hardware. Here you can see um, in the slide some of the examples, but by using, because they are relatively small, by using these um, tiles, we can compute a whole matrix multiplication regardless of, regardless of what's the size of the input and output matrices. So here you can uh, see what's the syntax for the different uh, instructions or different APIs that we have to use uh, to perform the matrix multiplication using the tensor cores. So here uh, we are going to, uh, uh, to uh, divide the inputs divide the matrices, the input and output matrices into fragments. So we have to declare these fragments and we are going to compute uh, on these fragments. So essentially these fragments are the sub matrices or the tiles that we are going to uh, compute on. Uh, these fragments are going to be stored internally in registers as uh, we have already mentioned before. Um, so. That, that here you, you can identify this one to fill fragment is uh, for initialization. This is to load a fragment from global memory into the registers to store a fragment back to global memory and to perform the uh, matrix multiplication operation. So let's take a closer look at each of them. First of all, at the uh, matrix fragment, um, and here you can see that uh, we have to define whether this uh, matrix fragment corresponds to either matrix A or matrix B or the accumulator. This is a fragment that um, uh, keeps the partial uh, results. Uh, here we have the um, fragment dimensions. We also have the data type, either uh, half precision or, or float precision or 8-bit uh, floating point precision, and also the layout, either it's a uh, row major or column major. We also have this uh, API field fragment in order to initialize a specific fragment with a certain constant value. We are going to use this one, for example, for the accumulator fragment, and we will initialize it to zero. And here you see how to uh, load a matrix fragment from memory. Observe that first of all, we need to have here the, um, uh, the, the fragment itself where we are going to uh, store the, the, the tile coming from the uh, global memory. And, and here in this example is called a frag. We also have the starting address to load from in either global memory or uh, shared memory as well could be possible. The leading matrix dimension that essentially defines a stripe 
to access the uh, output matrix and also the matrix layout. So these loading, as I mentioned before, might be done from global memory or from uh, shared memory. Uh, these um, matrix layout is in reality optional because, uh, or might be optional if uh, we are using um, so the fragment is for matrix A or for matrix B, uh, we can already infer from the fragment type because the fragment itself already uh, the, the defines what's the, the, the matrix layout that we are using. And um, yeah, this uh, particular example here, we are loading uh, some uh, tile from the uh, input matrix A into this uh, A frag uh, fragment. And here you uh, can see the corresponding uh, API to store a fragment into the uh, global or shared memory with the starting address where we are going to store the fragment to store the leading matrix dimension and the matrix layout in a similar way as we had in the load operation. And then we uh, also have to perform the matrix multiplication. So for the matrix multiplication, we have an output fragment where we're going to accumulate the result and we have three input fragments. The reason is that the computer, the operation that we perform is on a multiplication plus addition. So we are multiplying here fragment A and B and then we add uh, fragment C. And then there is also this uh, um, optional, um, this um, uh, uh, Boolean, um, uh, parameter uh, sat f that um, uh, defines how the saturation happens. And here you can uh, see the code is uh, relatively simple using the instructions that uh, we have the APIs that we have uh, mentioned before. This would be the, the uh, matrix multiplication. Uh, here we have like uh, three matrices A, B, and the output matrix C. So first of all, what we do is uh, well, as, as usual, we need to define the indices for the threads and the warps that are involved in this computation. And here we declare a fragment for matrix A, for matrix B, and also fragment accumulator, and also fragment for a matrix uh, C as well. First of all, we initialize the fragment uh, accumulator by assigning um, like uh, zero to all the elements because we are going to perform a matrix um, uh, multiplication and accumulation operations. So um, we have to initialize each of the elements uh, of the uh, accumulator that will be uh, the output later uh, to zero. And then uh, first of all, what we do here is uh, loading. So in, in, in several iter iterations, in order to go over the uh, whole input matrices, uh, we load fragments from matrix A into the uh, corresponding fragment, from matrix B into the corresponding fragment, and then we perform the uh, matrix multiplication. So fragment um, A times fragment B, and then we add uh, these uh, whatever has been previously accumulated into the uh, accumulator fragment that is also the output of this uh, operation here. So after being done and having these partial results in the accumulator fragment, we also, we have to uh, go to global memory as well in order to load a fragment from the output matrix C because we need to keep accumulating in this uh, output matrix C. So we first load the fragment from matrix C into the corresponding fragment. Then we perform this um, addition operation where uh, we are adding the uh, accumulator fragment and the seek fragment uh, multiplied by the corresponding constants if there are uh, any of these constants in our program. And finally, we store the fragment into the uh, corresponding location of the output matrix. So this is a, a simple example of how to use the uh, tensor cores uh, existing in NVIDIA GPUs in order to perform uh, matrix multiplication kernel. But this type of computation that the tensor cores uh, do resembles uh, another important type of uh, processor that are the systolic arrays that we have actually mentioned already in this course because we uh, introduced them in the first lecture. Actually, we talk about the tensor processing units from Google that were um, first announced in 2016 and presented at ISCA 2017. There have been, uh, as far as I know, four uh, generations of this uh, TPU, each of them being 
um, uh, twice as powerful as the previous one. This is the uh, generation two from 2017, uh, generation three, and the uh, fourth generation in 2021 uh, with a peak um, the throughput or of uh, 250 teraflops, teraflops per chip. This TPU is essentially a systolic array. And in a systolic array, uh, let me give you a very simple example for you to understand how systolic arrays uh, work. Let's assume that we want to compute the matrix multiplication of two small matrices, three by three matrices. Um, and in this particular example, we keep the final result in this case, uh, the output matrix C into the uh, accumulators of the processing elements. Each processing element looks like this. It's uh, relatively simple because uh, it, uh, it has an internal register, the accumulator to, to keep uh, partial results. And it has two inputs, M and N, as you see. And the systolic array does uh, two different things. First of all, it propagates the inputs to the outputs. So the, the, this uh, processing element of the systolic array propagates the inputs to the outputs. So P is equal to M and Q is equal to N, and then internally performs the multiplication and accumulation operation. And um, the complete systolic array for this toy example of uh, three by three matrix multiplication uh, looks like this. In this case, we need to use a systolic array of uh, three by three elements. And for example, if we, we want to uh, see how to compute this element zero, zero, as you know, we obtain this element zero, zero by multiplying, performing the dot product of this row and this column of B. So that's what we do in the systolic array is that the, every single cycle, we input a new value from matrix A and from matrix C. So here you have uh, in the first cycle, a0 and B00 get multiplied and accumulated into the register that we have here, or the accumulator that we have here. In the next cycle is the element A01 times element B10. So A01 times B10. And in the third cycle is element A20 times B, uh, sorry, A02 times B20. So after three, three cycles, we'll have here in the, the internal register of this processing element, the result of the uh, uh, corresponding, for the corresponding element of the output matrix C. And this is uh, one more view of the uh, Google TPU here. You can identify this matrix multiply unit that is indeed the systolic array. Observe how the systolic array receives from uh, two different sides the, uh, the weights um, of the um, uh, convolutional layer, for example, the weights uh, of, of the mask um, that we need uh, for, um, you know, apply a filter or a uh, a mask in, in one of the layers of our neural network, and also the um, uh, inputs coming from uh, here, from this uh, local, um, so this unified buffer and this uh, systolic data setup. And, and here we also see some accumulations and then some uh, activation functions and uh, etc. So if you want to learn more about uh, systolic arrays, I would recommend you this lecture from uh, Professor Mutley. And if you want to learn more about uh, convolution on uh, GPUs and also machine learning on GPUs, uh, please take a look at these chapters 7 and 16 in the book, Programming Massively Parallel Processors. So this is all for today. I hope you found this lecture useful. And I also hope to uh, see you in the next lecture of this course, uh, Ohm Systems. Thank you very much for your attention.